Luke chapter 15, uh, this is another one of the parables of Jesus that most people have some level of familiarity with, um, at, uh, to the point that even if people don't really know what the word prodigal means, it's a little bit like Samaritan. A lot of people don't know what Samaritan means, and so their only frame of reference becomes the parable of the good Samaritan. Uh, this is particularly true with artistic depictions. One article says, of the 30 or so parables in the Gospels, the prodigal son is one of four that were shown in medieval art and almost to the exclusion of others. From the Renaissance, scenes of the prodigal son became the clear favorite. In the 15th and 16th centuries, the, the theme was a sufficiently popular subject that the prodigal son play even became known as a subgenre in the English theater. There's a statue called the Prodigal Son in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where my family's from. Uh, outside the Speed Art Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, Rudyard Kipling, who wrote The Jungle Book, has a poem entitled The Prodigal Son. William Shakespeare refers to this parable in two of his comedies. Listen to the list of musical artists, and by the way, these are only a few, who either have songs or albums titled after The Prodigal Son. Ted Nugent, <laughs> the Osmonds, Iron Maiden, U2, Kid Rock, The Killers. In fact, right around the time that I was graduating from high school, okay, and this is really going to date me, there was a very popular rap song that came out by a group called House of Pain called Jump Around. And in one of the verses, Everlast sings, Word to your moms, I came to drop bombs. I've got more rhymes than the Bible's got psalms. And just like the prodigal son, I've returned. Anyone step into me, you'll get burned. Now, a lot of you who know that song are going to go back now and listen to it. <laughs> You're going to be like, really? I didn't know that was in there. But we're reminded, as one secular author notes, that even among those who know very little of the Bible... The parables of Jesus remain some of the best known stories in the world. Now, we always want to take note of the overall context of the passage that we're looking at, looking at. And the parable of the prodigal son comes right on the heels of two other somewhat well-known parables of Jesus. In verses 1 through 7 of Luke chapter 15, you have the parable of the lost sheep. And then in verses 8 through 10, you've got the parable of the lost coin. And many people see a direct connection between those two parables and the parable of the prodigal son this morning. Uh, check out Luke chapter 15, verse 7. Jesus concludes the parable of the lost sheep by saying, I say to you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. In verse 10, Jesus concludes the parable of the lost coin by saying similarly, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so both of those parables deal with the idea, uh, the moral, the main point of those stories is repentance. But then as you come to the parable of the prodigal son, it's like Jesus now tells a story that illustrates the repentance that he's been talking about. In fact, Bible commentator David Guzik writes, the lost son demonstrates the repentance Jesus spoke of in the previous parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. So Jesus is really emphasizing something in this chapter, and it's the good news, check this out, that though something or someone may be lost for a time, our Father, God, and Jesus, His Son, passionately loves us and wants us to come back to him, that we can be brought back into a right relationship with the God who created us. So let's do what we normally do. We're going to read through the parable, and then again we'll pause and sort of unpack some things together. Now I want to point this out before we get into it. Uh, this parable very neatly divides itself into two halves. In the first half, we look almost exclusively at the younger son who selfishly demands his inheritance from his father, and then he goes and spends it all on wasteful living. In fact, that's where the parable takes its name. The word prodigal simply means wasteful. The second half, the, sh the focus shifts to that of the older brother who does not leave home, and who becomes jealous and angry and bitter and resentful when the younger son does come home, at the Father's reception and restoration and celebration over that. Both of these halves 
are filled with all kinds of practical applications for us as believers. But given our time constraints this morning, right? We're only going to be looking at the first half. And I offer that disclaimer because if I don't, I guarantee you somebody's going to come up to me and say, you didn't even talk about the older brother. Somebody's probably going to do it now anyway. In fact, there's probably more people who are going to do it now that I mentioned something about it. Anyway, I know there's all kinds of lessons in the second half, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time and just look at the first half this morning. So let's start reading in verse 11. Here's what we read. Then Jesus said to them, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So the father divided them to them his livelihood, verse 13, and not many days after the young son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, verse 14, there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. So then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and the citizen sent him into his fields to feed swine. Verse 16, and the younger son would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. This is important. And no one gave him anything. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And yet I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he arose, verse 20, came to his father, and when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, verse 22, bring out the best robe and put it on my son and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. So there's a lot in here this morning. Okay, back in verse 12, many people point out the fact that typically in these days, an inheritance would not be received until after the father had died. Okay, so by asking for his inheritance now, the son is essentially communicating to his father, I wish you were dead. I kind of just need you out of the way, dad, so I can get what's coming to me. In other words, this son saw his father as nothing more than a means to an end. Now, what's amazing to me about this is that the father gives it to him. This makes me think of Romans chapter one. In Romans chapter one, we read this. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. By the way, this verse tells us that deep down, everybody knows there's a God. Okay, so if somebody tells you they don't believe in God, just know this. They do, deep down, know that there is a God. We have been created that way, and Scripture, the Word of God, tells us that He has clearly made Himself known, and that He is understood by the things that are made. But verse 2 tells us this, or sorry, verse 21 tells us this, that although people knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God nor were thankful, but instead became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. People are probably thinking, Kevin, what does this have to do with the parable of the prodigal son? Verse 24 says this, therefore, in other words, that's that's a word that means because of that, right? Because of the fact that God has clearly made himself known, And that God is understood by the things that are created, but we instead changed God's glory into something that we wanted him to be. Scripture says this, therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts. Verse 26 says, God gave them up 
to vile passions. Verse 28 says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. One of the most sobering truths of the Bible is this. If we are bound and determined to live a certain way, even if it is against God's will, God will let us. When the children of Israel are being led out of Egypt and the plagues are coming down and God is clearly demonstrating his superiority over the Egyptian gods multiple times, we read what? That Pharaoh hardened his heart. God gives Pharaoh an opportunity to repent, but Pharaoh hardens his heart. But eventually, what do we read? That God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, it wasn't God hardening Pharaoh's heart to begin with. It was Pharaoh hardening his heart, hardening his heart, hardening his heart, until what does God eventually do? Eventually, God solidifies Pharaoh in that position. He confirms Pharaoh in his opposition to God. David Guzik writes this of the father in this parable. The father clearly illustrates God's love. His love allowed rebellion and in some sense respected human will. The father knew that the son made a foolish request, and yet he allowed him to go his course nonetheless. And I would just say this. How many times have we presumed upon God's blessings? How many times have we taken something that God has given us? In fact, we've demanded more from God only to take those resources those blessings, that stewardship, that responsibility, and rather than living in such a way that it gives honor to God, we've just wasted it and spent it the way we want to live. Matthew Henry writes this, willful sinners waste their patrimony. They misemploy thoughts and all the powers of their souls. They misspend their time and opportunities. They don't only bury, but embezzle the talents they are entrusted to trade for their master's honor, which, intended to enable them to serve God and to do good, instead are made the food and fuel of their lusts. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 says, One sinner destroys much good, but the good he destroys is none of his own. They are his Lord's goods that he wastes, and which he must be accounted for. Verse 12 says that the father divided to them his livelihood. Not after many days, the younger son gathered together all he had, journeyed into a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. By the way, this wasn't just dumb decisions, okay? This was immoral decisions. This was sinful decisions. Down in verse 30, we're told this one little detail that the son devoured his father's livelihood with harlots, prostitutes. But watch what happens, verse 14. When he had spent all, there arose a famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So take note of what happens here. The son spends everything he has, and these are choices completely within his control. They're dumb decisions, They're immoral decisions, but ultimately he has no one to blame but himself. But now circumstances arise over which he has no control, which only serve to inflame his situation and make it worse. We read of this severe famine in the land. If this guy had made better choices, if he hadn't wasted everything he had been given, when this famine came he wouldn't have been as bad off as he was. But this is why we need to be good stewards with what God has given us, because we never know when things are going to happen over which we have absolutely no control. Notice the last phrase of verse 14. He began to be in want. This phrase stands out in such stark contrast to what we read in Psalm 23. David there tells us this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, what? Want. Psalm 34 tells us there is no want to those who fear him. Even the young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. 
This man is such a picture of the person who has strayed from the provision and the protection and the blessing of the Lord. He is in tremendous want. Check this out. Even though he got exactly what he wanted, he got exactly what he asked for. He chased after what he wanted, but look where it left him. This reminds me of the children of Israel in Psalm 106, verse 15. The children of Israel demanded that God give them meat. And check this out. God gave them meat over and over and over and over. So much so that God says, I'm going to give you meat until it comes out your nose. And then in Psalm 106, verse 15, we read this. Check this out. God gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Did you know that sometimes God will give you exactly what you want, only to demonstrate it is not what you need, and that it ultimately does not satisfy? This young man is in tremendous want. And by the way, he's not merely inconvenienced by the situation. Down in verse 17, he says, I perish with hunger. Okay, this guy was desperate. He's at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. And then out of this place of tremendous want, guess what? He begins to make even more bad decisions. Verse 15 says, he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now I see such a picture of being unequally yoked here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Because what fellowship does righteousness have with lawlessness? What communion does light have with darkness? What accord does Christ have with Belial? What part does a believer have with an unbeliever? And I see this all the time. People stray from following after the Lord. And then they begin to fill their lives with friendships and allegiances, perhaps connections, even addictions and behaviors that further create separation and distance from God. David Guzik writes, driven by hunger and need, the son now accepts work that was unacceptable and offensive to any righteous Jewish person because swine were unclean under the law. This detail, though it's somewhat lost on us culturally, this little detail would have been incredibly offensive to Jesus' listeners of the day. Verse 16 says, He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. This guy was hungering after pig slop. And it is true when a person turns from following after the Lord, you guys know we will turn to just about anything to try to satisfy our bellies. Again, Bible commentator Matthew Henry writes this, the sinful state is a wanting state. It represents the misery of sinners who have thrown away their own mercies, the favor of God, their interest in Christ. These they give away for the pleasure of sense and the wealth of the world, and are ready to perish for want of them. Sinners want necessaries for their souls. They have neither food, nor raiment, nor any provision. A sinful state is like a land where famine reigns. Heavens are as brass, the earth is as iron. Sinners are wretchedly and miserably poor, and what aggravates it, they brought themselves into that condition and keep themselves in it, by refusing the supplies that are offered. Now to me, an extremely important phrase comes at the end of verse 16. I mean, this is the phrase that I believe the narrative begins to shift. Here's what we read. No one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. Now one of the real tricks... It's probably not the best word to use. One of the real disciplines when it comes to studying the Bible or reading the Bible is what Paul calls in 2 Timothy, rightly dividing the word of truth. In another place, Paul talks about comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. It's been said the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. 
we have to take the truth of what's being taught in this passage this morning and marry it alongside even what we read earlier in the same chapter. Verses 1 through 7 in the parable of the lost sheep, uh, Jesus says in verse 4, if you want to look there with me, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep which was lost. Verses 8 through 10, the parable of the lost coin. Again, Jesus similarly says this, What woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which was lost. And so in both of those parables, Jesus tells stories of someone who leaves one place to go after someone or something and find that which was lost. But check it out. In our parable this morning, the father does not come after the prodigal son. Again, we're told at the end of verse 16, no one gave him anything. What does that mean? Okay, for the person who says we should always go after people who leave and walk away from the Lord. People who stop going to church, we should drop what we're doing and we should run after them. After all, doesn't the Lord leave the 99 to go after the one? I would say this, what about the rich young ruler? Who when he turned from following after Jesus, Jesus didn't go after him. In John chapter 6, where we read that many of Jesus' disciples went back and walked with him no more. Jesus doesn't go after them. Judas, Jesus knew what Judas was up to. In fact, Jesus even identifies Judas in the middle of the the Last Supper. But he doesn't stop him. And again, right in our parable this morning, what of the Father, who clearly, clearly in this parable, represents God the Father? What of him not coming after the straying son? What do we do? I would say this. It depends. It depends on how the Spirit of God directs you or me to respond in a situation. If you know someone in your life who has walked away and you're wondering what to do, you need to pray about it. And you need to keep praying about it. And you need to be in the word of God about it and let the spirit of God speak to you about what to do. We need to be very careful that we don't take certain things from the Bible and turn them into dogma and say that God always acts the same way In every single situation. Are there times where I believe God would have us drop everything and go after someone who has walked away? Absolutely. I would point to Luke chapter 15. And I would say yes. But are there times when I believe God would simply have us let someone walk away? Absolutely. And you know what? I'd go to the same chapter of the Bible. Luke chapter 15. Because both of those things are clearly demonstrated in this chapter. But in this parable, okay, the parable we're looking at this morning, in this situation, here's why I believe this is important, okay? We have to be so careful when we're studying the Bible that we don't look at what's right in front of us and go over here and start thinking about this passage. We're not in that passage. We're in Luke chapter 15, verse 16. And I believe the phrase that we read at the end of verse 16 is the catalyst for what we read at the beginning of verse 17. Because note how the narrative plays out. Look at the end phrase of verse 16. No one gave him anything. Some of you guys aren't looking at it. You're looking at me. Look at the last phrase of verse 16. No one gave him anything. And now the next phrase And when he came to himself. See, those two things clearly go hand in hand. Now, here's what we don't know. Again, 
We don't know because the passage doesn't tell us this this morning, but there's a possibility that if someone had given this young man something, he may have turned around and simply continued to live a very wasteful lifestyle. But by no one giving him anything, check it out, it's like a spell is broken. It's like blinders come off. It's like there's this awakening that takes place. A fog is lifted, and for a moment, there's clarity. And he sees his situation for exactly what it is. David Guzik writes, in his misery, the prodigal son was finally able to think clearly. Before, it might be said that he wasn't really himself and thought as another man. And then he came to himself. And then watch what he says. Verse 17, this is beautiful. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Watch this. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Up to this point, up to this point right here, I would say it's remorse. If the son stopped right there, there's remorse. The son feels bad over what he's done. He sees his actions for what they are. He gives voice to it. He even identifies it as sin. He's got a plan in place for what he's going to do. He even rehearses what he's going to say to his father. But how many people stop right there? How many people find themselves in a desperate situation? They know what they've done. They acknowledge what they've done. They even know what they need to do to make things right. And then they do nothing. That's remorse. Okay, even Judas knew what he had done. Matthew chapter 27 verse 3 says, Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders and said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And he threw the pieces of silver down in the temple. And then you know what he did? He went out and he hung himself because there was no repentance there is such a big difference between remorse and repentance. I have sat in my office countless times over the past 27 years in full-time ministry. And I've listened to people acknowledge their wrongdoing. I've watched many tears be shed and I've listened to all kinds of promises be made. And then absolutely nothing is done. Scripture does not teach us to go speak words that are worthy of repentance. It says, go bear fruits that are worthy of repentance, to take action. For this young man, his remorse does not become repentance until what we read in verse 20. Check this out. And he arose and he came to his father. That's repentance. That's repentance. Repentance isn't feelings. I'm not saying that feelings aren't important or that God can't use feelings to prompt us into action. He can. Things like remorse, even regret, they can be used tremendously of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talked about how his letter that he had written to the church, he said, made them sorry. But then he says this, I don't regret it. He says, I rejoice that you were made sorry. Why? He says, because godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation not to be regretted. He says, observe this very thing. Check it out is what he says. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. But without action, feelings, nothing more than feelings. That's all they are. <laughs> feelings are just feelings. They mean nothing without action. Or thoughts. On this point, Charles Spurgeon said this, some of you, 
have been thinking and thinking and thinking till I fear that you will think yourselves into damnation. Repentance takes action. The very word means to change one's mind or direction. It's a U-turn. If this young man had had all these feelings of remorse and all these feelings of regret, even good intentions, but didn't do anything, but when he says, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go back to my father, and then he actually does it, that's glorious. That's repentance. That's when everything changes. And notice too, he isn't wishing for a change in his circumstance. He's not calling for more money or an improved living situation. David Guzik writes, in his clear thinking, he didn't think of how to improve his condition in the pig pen. He didn't blame his father or his brother or his friends, his boss or the pigs. He recognized his misery without focusing on it. He didn't think of his home or his village, but of his father. When he returned to the father, he came back to the village and to the house, but his focus was on returning to his father. It was the relationship that he longed for. He writes, this is how we need to come back to God, to come back to him first and foremost before seeking an improved situation or coming back to church or Christian friends. And check this out, nobody could do this for him. Repentance is a very personal thing. He says, I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to my father, I have sinned before heaven and you. He says, I'm going to do this. And also notice this. It's very subtle. But notice how his desires have changed. Where he first says to his father, give me my inheritance. He now says, make me. And it is such a breakthrough in our spiritual lives when our demands of God change from give me to make me. And we stop seeing God purely as a means to an end, but we recognize that what we need him to do is to change us and transform us within. Watch what happens, verse 20. As this young man is still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And, and as every time I read this, I wonder how many times this father had been out working in the field and paused in his work and, and scanned the horizon to see if his son was going to come back home. And check this out. He isn't angry. He doesn't scold him. He doesn't put him on probation. He doesn't say, I told you so. We read the father had compassion on him and ran to him and fell on him and kissed him. And in the original language, it's over and over and over. This father is so overjoyed that his son has come home. He loved his son. Even though he never went after him. He loved him. He let his son go. He knew that he was making a mistake. But that didn't mean the father didn't love him. Marvin Pate said, the depth of the son's repentance is matched only by the depth of this father's love. And of course, the son launches into his prepared speech. Verse 21, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But it's like the father doesn't even hear him. He says to his servant, quick. That's what it means when we read bring. It literally means quickly bring. Quickly bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. Sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf. Let's have a feast. One commentator points out, none of the four things brought to the prodigal were necessities. They were all meant to honor the son and make him know that his father loved him. The father did more than merely meet the son's needs. Why? Read verse 24. The father says this, this my son was dead and is alive again. Again. 
He was lost and is found. Once more, David Guzik writes, it's a happy thing to find a lost sheep and a lost coin. It's much more happy to find a lost son. This wasn't just finding a son. It was as if the son were back from the dead. And they began to make merry. Now, I, I'm sure that everybody here is familiar with the rest of the parable. In verses 25 through 32, this young man has an older brother who becomes angry when he learns of his brother's return and his father's treatment of him. And the father goes to the older son in verse 28, and he pleads with him. And the older brother says in verse 29, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, can't even call him his brother, as soon as this son of yours came, who's devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. He's bitter and resentful. But the father reasons with him in verse 31. He says, son, you've always been with me. And all that I have is yours. Watch this. He says, it was right. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. I want you to think for just a moment, who are you in this parable? Okay, this, this is one of those parables. I was saying to my family last night, this is one of those parables that the challenge is, how do you apply it? I mean, there is so much here that it becomes difficult to draw out one overarching principle and say, this is how this applies. So instead, I would just ask you this question, who are you in this parable? Are you a child who only sees God as a means to an end? You, you want the benefits of the relationship with him, but you don't want to remain in his house or under his care. Are you a father who's watching a child make a bad mistake or you feel taken advantage of? Perhaps spiritually speaking, you've been discipling someone and now you're watching as they walk away from the Lord. Are you wasting your life with bad decisions? I can tell you this, there was a point in my life when I was a burned out pothead sitting in church and I knew that I knew that I knew I was the prodigal. I was wasting my life. I was taking everything God had given me and just squandering it. Is that you? Are you utterly spent? Are you at the end of your rope? Are you perishing with hunger? And you're just sort of desperately trying to, to fill your belly with anything you can find. Are you ready to return? Are you waiting? Are you like the father, right? Where you've watched someone walk away and now you're just waiting. You've got your eyes peeled and you're in prayer because you want to see this person come back. Are you in the father's house knowing how a brother or sister has taken advantage of their spiritual birthright, and now you're watching them come back. But rather than being ecstatic about that, man, it burns you up to see how it's just celebrated that they're coming back. You see, the reality is we're all in different places. We're in different roles this morning. There are lessons here for every single one of us. And so here's what I want to encourage us to do. When we say amen this morning, don't see the end of this service as the conclusion. See it as an introduction. Okay, take time this week. Go home. Get back into this passage. Chew it up. Pray it in. Run your relationships through the grid of this scripture. Run your life through the grid of this passage of scripture. And ask for God's wisdom as to who you are where you're at, what he would have you do. And of course, if you're here this morning, if you're listening online this morning, and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that this morning, okay? Look, 
Yeah, you can sit in the quiet sanctuary of your heart and you can make the determination, I will rise and go to my father. But I'll tell you this, whenever Jesus called someone to follow him in scripture, he called them to do it publicly. And there is something about when you're in a setting like this and an opportunity is given to say, I will get up. I will get up and I will go and I will acknowledge before my father where I'm at, what I've done, but that I'm so ready to come back. And and I'll tell you this, guys. Kayla's going to come up here and sing a song for us this morning. Some of you have probably heard the song. It's it's an old song. It became very popular by a band named Phillips, Craig, and Dean called When God Ran. Because it's been said that the only time God ran in Scripture, that we see God run in Scripture, is this parable right here. It was so out of the ordinary for a man, excuse me, a grown man, a man of stature and wealth, to run. That would have been considered almost a social faux pas. So for this man to run, you see, God is so ready. He's on the lookout. He is waiting for us to return to him. If that's you this morning, I want to give you that opportunity. Kayla, why don't you come on up? I want to give you that opportunity to respond this morning. And look, maybe it's not about you giving your life to Jesus Christ for the very first time. Maybe it is. Maybe instead for you, it's just you're in that place of being wasted and burnout, and you just know, you just know you need to come back.